Hi, it's Rory from CounselingTutor.com and in this presentation I'm going to discuss the concept of boundaries and certainly issues around boundaries and contracting. So if you're a new therapist or someone who's just um, started on their uh, counsellor training in their practice years, um, might be a useful video for you to have a look at and consider personal boundaries, professional boundaries. Um, so without further ado, Let's go over to the PowerPoint and uh, have a look at issues around boundaries. Okay, so here we are at the PowerPoint and it's entitled Professional Ethics, Boundaries in Counselling Relationships. So first, we got, first thing we're going to look at is the concept of boundaries. Um, and boundaries are a sense of personal identity which is consistent over time. So in other words, boundaries are about knowing exactly the roles that you have in the relationship. And this is both, I guess, for the client as well as the therapist, understanding exactly why they are there and what they are there for. Um, boundaries should remain constant regardless of emotional ups and downs or external pressures. So the, the, the notion is that we understand why we are there as therapists what our duties are, what our roles are, and that shouldn't alter even if the relationship in therapy as it sometimes does becomes turbulent um, or maybe the organisation applies external pressure and says, you know, is there any chance you can see this client at home? You know, they, they're quite desperate, that type of thing. Can you, can you go tomorrow, you know, when you're not supposed to be in, that type of thing. So, so a, a boundary should be consistent um, regardless of what's going on outside um, the the contract, for want of a better want of a better way of putting it, the contract within which the therapist and client relationship occurs. So, all um, therapy takes place within a contract, and the concept of boundaries lives within that. And that will be things such as the time, date, um, a venue that therapy takes place, what can be offered by the therapist, um, you know, clearly what the client wants, but also thinking about if the client wants to be able to phone you at home at any hour of the day and night, again, that's a boundary issue. So it's about making sure that right at the beginning of the therapeutic alliance, right when you start, the client is clear on what you can offer and what you can't. It provides a system of limit setting. So that's for both the client and the therapist. Limit setting means that both parties can leave the therapy room knowing that what they've come to do has, has been undertaken. Might not be that someone leaves feeling that they're cured or better, for want of a better phrase, but it does set limits to what can be done it also sets limits to where the therapist um, gets involved in anything other than therapy. Um, it's a line between the self of clients and the self of the therapist. So it's very, very easy if you're working in the frame of reference of a client to lose yourself and get lost in that frame of reference to the point where you almost feel like you're experiencing what the client's experiencing when you're not working with them. That's quite a dangerous thing for a therapist because it means that they cannot disconnect from the work and that can ultimately lead to burnout um, and very woolly boundaries where um, the therapist may be believing that they need to contact the client in between sessions um, or become more of a friend than a professional therapist. So it really does help us as professionals make sure we can get back into our own lives, make sure we can go back into our own frame of reference. So why do we talk about boundaries? Well, first of all, it reduces the risk of client exploitation. By having a clear contract and clear boundaries, it means that um, we're, we're open to scrutiny. If, any, if a complaint's made, then we can show the contract and say, this is what we did and this is why we did it and that the clients agreed and it's all above board and transparent so it reduces the risk of client exploitation 
It reduces clients' anxiety as rules and roles are clear. And it may be strange to think of rules in a therapy relationship, but sometimes having structure reduces clients' anxiety. It means they know exactly why they're there, exactly how long they're going to be there for, what's on offer, what the limits of confidentiality. So they don't have to worry about that or unduly worry about it because it's been discussed and contracted right at the beginning of the therapeutic relationship. It increases the well-being of the therapist. Having clear boundaries means that you can leave the therapy room and re-engage with your own life and get on with the things other than being a counsellor and a therapist. Um, and that's important because, again, as, I, as, as I've discussed earlier, very, very easy to get involved in burnout um, and for boundaries to become very woolly if you cannot separate yourself from the work. And it provides a role model for clients. Something that's not often discussed, I think, in terms of being a therapist is that clients do look to the therapist as, as a kind of structure for how they may be. And if, if a therapist has got really good boundaries, then that might help a, a client put boundaries in their own life to see that it's okay to say, no, I'm afraid I can't do that. Or no, I'm afraid I can't see you on that time and date. It can be a really educational thing for a client because if, if, us, if us as therapists can do it, then hey, clients can do that as well and say no. And for some clients, that can be a bit of a struggle. So who negotiates the boundaries? Well, it's the duty of a therapist to act in the best interest of the client. So really, um, the contract takes care of a lot of the boundary issues because it's the duty of the therapist to make a contract right at the beginning of therapy. The therapist is ultimately responsible for managing boundary issues. So it's ultimately down to the therapist to, to for want of a better phrase, make sure or police the boundary issues and to say to a client, if those boundaries are getting a bit pushed, maybe a client wants to see you four times a week or wants your home phone number, it's okay for the therapist to say, well, actually, that's not what we've contracted for. And actually, I can't do that. We can maybe have to find you some other form of support between sessions, but I can't be available on tap all the time. As I've said before, boundaries are drastic contracting. So when we talk about boundaries, what we're really talking about is the nature of the relationship. And that is around um, the time, the venue, the duration of therapy, how long, if there's a cost, how much. Um, and also, I always say to my clients, you know, if you see me in the street, um, how would, do you want me to ad address you? Do you want me to ignore you? Because um, some clients would prefer that, then they don't have to explain why, why a man is smiling at them in the street to their partners who may not know they're going to therapy. What would you like? And, and again, it's about negotiating. Um, and boundaries um, can sometimes be pushed. I've had clients in the past um, kind of stop me in the street and introduce me to their um, their relatives, which is fine as as long as as long as I um, am thoughtful about what I say in that situation. Both parties should be clear on the relationship. I think it's very important right at the beginning of the therapy, again at the contracting stage, that both parties know exactly what they're getting into. It's therapy that's being on offer. It's not any other form of support, and it's certainly not um, a personal friendship. So right at the beginning, the contract should make that clear. So why is it the therapist's responsibility? Well, the therapist is the professional in the room um, in terms of, the, in terms of uh, developing therapy and being a therapist. Clients may not be aware of the need for boundaries or able to defend themselves against boundary violations. Certainly in my experience, working with really vulnerable clients, I've been aware that in some cases, clients just don't have any boundaries. You could say to them, do you want to come back to our house for tea? And they'd say, yes, please. So you've got to be very thoughtful that, that some clients just don't have boundaries. So you need to be thoughtful and need to make sure that they understand why there are boundaries in place and if you if you have got really good boundaries then when they see another professional maybe for something else or some other form of support they know what the right thing is and how professionals should be treating them um, 
and I think that's important as well. So there's again, there's an educative factor in there. There's an inherent power imbalance between the worker or the client and the therapist is perceived as having power and control. So, you know, no matter how much we try and reduce power with um, the use of language, with with the, the use of the contract, we always have to remember that ultimately there is a, a balance of power that's in the therapist's favour. Um, and, and we need to um, try to, to balance that the best we can. So I'm going to give you some examples of boundaries being breached. Um, planning social activities with clients. I have heard of therapists who plan social activities with clients. And, yeah, and when I'm talking about social activities, I'm talking about going out for a meal, going to the pub. There's, I've, I've read in the BACP sanctions section in Therapy Today of, of, of therapists turn up with people's houses with presents for clients, that type of thing. So that's a clear breach. Having an intimate relationship with a client. Well, when I'm talking about an intimate relationship, I'm really talking about having a relationship other than being a therapist. So being a boyfriend, girlfriend, um, you know, ha having an intimate relationship is is a, certainly a boundary issue. Having family members as friends, as clients. Um, I don't think this happens often, but it's amazing how often members of my family have said to me, not my close family, I have to say, but distant members of a family have said, oh, you know, could I come to you for therapy? And uh, I politely decline and, and point them in the direction of uh, a relevant support agency. So just to summarise, a client should not be uh, a lover, shouldn't be um, a relative, um, an employee or an employer, a teacher, a business partner, a friend. Um, shouldn't be any of those. And the BACP Code of Ethics, and in fact all ethical frameworks as far as I'm aware, talk of dual relationships. And a dual relationship is a relationship where um, the client for you is, is also somebody else. So there's some examples there, a relative or an employer. So you're having two different relationships at the same time. Uh, it's not an exclusive relationship where you're just their therapist and that's that can be a, a dual relationship. Final points, if you're concerned about a client pushing your boundaries, then speak with your supervisor, um, get peer support, speak to another therapist, just explore it. That's that's quite an ethical thing to do. Um, clients, some clients will push boundaries and will sometimes want a relationship other than a therapeutic one. And if that's the case, then you need to protect yourself and them and um, you know do the right thing. And sometimes, ultimately, you might need to do a referral. So I hope that's not been too much death by PowerPoint. Hope that's been useful for you. And uh, thank you for watching. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that video on boundaries. If you have, don't forget to like, don't forget to share us. And why not put a comment in the comments bar below? We'd love to hear from you. And as I said earlier in the video, thank you for watching. Your very good health.